turn to Genesis chapter 28, the text of scripture we already read this morning. And we are looking at this uh, familiar account, this history of Jacob at Bethel, of Jacob and his ladder, as is being commonly called, Jacob's ladder. And we're going to be looking at this text today, and then next week we'll jump over into chapter 29, and we'll look at Jacob and his marriage is, his plural marriages, which is interesting to talk about. Genesis 28, we already read the text this morning. Um, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's help as we open the inerrant word. Father, help us today as we come to hear from you that we would have open ears, open minds, open hearts to receive what you have written down and you have inscripturated for us. Lord, help us to remove distractions. May your spirit to do this work in removing these distractions from us. Uh, the ones outside of this assembly, the ones that have been happening all week or are happening this coming week, good and bad, and also the ones that happen in our hearts even while we hear your word, so that we might grow as we know that faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. So Spirit, please help us today as you have promised. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 28, the text we already read today, can be divided into two parts. Part one really is the conclusion of the chiasm, or the last week's sermon. Uh, the first nine verses we read last week and even just briefly mentioned is when Isaac makes Jacob the son of blessing. Isaac, he blesses Jacob with the blessing, the birthright blessing that Jacob thinks that he has uh, stolen or received through his ingenuity. Um, and then... What happens, because he supposedly stole this through his deception, the, sec the, the rest of that is now he's on the run. <laughs> now he's running from his brother whom he stole it from. And so then we have the epilogue of the whole story that we looked at last week, Esau's Ishmaelite marriage in an attempt to please his parents. The second half of Genesis 28, where we'll spend the bulk of our time today, is Jacob on the run, particularly him, Jacob, at a place called Bethel. Bethel is significant and will be significant through the Old Testament, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but that's why the text focuses on this. This is really only a couple of days after he's left, and there's a lot more journey before he gets to where he's going, and so... The Holy Spirit says, hey, but this is an important thing right here that happens. And so we're going to stop and talk about this one night a couple of days after he leaves rather than all the nights on his trip because this one has significance to it. So let's just quickly review what happens in the narrative, the story here. As we learned last week, Jacob and his mom, Rebecca, conspired to claim the patriarchal blessing or the birthright blessing um, from Jacob's older brother, by minutes an older brother, Esau. Their scheme was elaborate, but short-sighted. Short-sighted for a couple of reasons. First, they obviously were going to get caught. Like, what did they think was going to happen as soon as Esau comes to bring the meal to his father? Like, it, this is, but isn't this kind of the way it is when we have a brilliant idea of how we're going to get something? And we go, oh, I didn't think about the consequences. Obviously, he's going to get caught. So short-sighted for that reason. But the second reason that this is sh so short-sighted is that God had already determined that regardless of politicking or plotting, that Jacob was destined to have this blessing, to be the next patriarch. He'd been told that since before he was born, Rebekah and Isaac had heard this from God. And so it really seems foolish and short-sighted. God says, here, I'm going to give this to you. And their response is, let's figure out how we can get this. But it's not the way that works. Short-sighted. The Lord did not need Rebekah and Jacob to sort things out for him. But patience and trust in a divine word and divine timing 
is difficult for time-beholden anxious creatures. So I think we can resonate a little bit of what's going on here because we are that, if anything. But as God does, He sovereignly and mercifully used the sinful manipulation of people to bring about His already established will and plan. In other words, God doesn't need them, but he uses them to accomplish his will. So he is not tainted by their sinful deception, and he is not manipulated by their sinful deception into bringing something to pass. And yet he uses even their sinful manipulation for his glory and for the good of all humanity. There are many, many places in Scripture, this is just one of them, where we will read about this compatibilism with God's sovereignty and man's human responsibility. This is just one example of this. Well, because of their sinful choice and because they deceived Esau, he, the skillful hunter, is enraged. He screams a primal scream in the text. And he is determined that he will kill his brother, has Cain-like rage. The only difference being Abel was innocent, except in this case, Jacob's not innocent. So Rebekah, sensing that Esau really means it this time, that this, this, the brothers have now, the, the fighting has gotten to the place where someone's going to die and someone's going to kill, and it's probably going to be the skilled hunter doing the killing and the smooth-skinned man doing the dying, her favorite, Uh, she has a plan. Send him to my family under the protection of my family in Padan Aram. It's where she's from. It's where her brother Laban still lives, who has become quite successful. We've learned earlier an account of Laban. We first were introduced to him. He was sort of introduced um, implicitly as a little bit of a sleazy guy, looking out for money and looking out for number one. Um, Whatever the case may be, we're going to see that's, that's true. And so go to Laban, to the house of Bethuel, who is uh, the son of, of Nahor, and, and so on. And that really comes back to being um, Abraham's extended family. So extended family of Jacob and Esau. This urgency must be severe because he leaves that day that all this happened. And later on, he will say that he went to Paran Aram with just his staff. He didn't pack anything. He's gone. That's how dangerous the threat is. Before he leaves, Abraham blesses Jacob with this patriarchal blessing. And that's in chapter 28, 3 through 4. We, would read, we read that blessing there. A question might come up just very briefly. Why would Isaac blessed Jacob with the patriarchal blessing when Jacob deceived him. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is just a simple answer. A parent's love for their child is relentless. Every parent understands this. <laughs> like your kids can hit you all they want, and yet at the same, you're going to be the one they call and you're going to be there. But a bigger reason, I think, is that Isaac understands he was wrong to try to thwart God's will, to try to get his will instead of God's. Because God had said, it was a divine oracle that was given, that Jacob would be the patriarch. And so I think Isaac here relents. I think he repents, you could say, of his attempt to overthrow God's will for his own, and he gives the blessing. Now, it's, very, it's, it's similar to that patriarch blessing God gave to Abraham, but there's a couple of differences. One, it comes from Isaac, rather than from God, he's, he's pleading with God to do it. He says, may God Almighty, so may Elohim, Elohim Shaddai do this for you. And then he basically sums it up by saying, by giving you the Abrahamic blessing, the blessing of Abraham. So he doesn't spell it out, but he says just the Abraham blessing, which we would understand is what God had given Abraham. So it is the patriarchal blessing.
Now, the interesting thing here is that then as he's leaving, Esau is said to try to find some way to impress his father or somehow, somehow fix things. And so he decides to fix things by making a bad choice, a worse choice, which once again, I think we can resonate a little bit with that. And so he says, well, they didn't like my first marriages to pagan women, so I'll marry a half-pagan woman. Now, I'll kind of add a third wife into the mix, and they should be happy with that. And they weren't, <laughs> and it wasn't a good thing he did. But that's how the story kind of ends, and then now Jacob is on the run. So that brings up the second half, which is really we're going to spend our time and that is, let, let's look at the setting here of what's going on, where Jacob's going and all that. It says, he went out from Beersheba, went toward Haran. Now, uh, Haran is in Syria, modern-day Syria, actually uh, just north of that, and it was a part of ancient Syria as well. This is where Abraham and his father Terah, his brother Nahor, his nephew Lot, and their families all came out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of the pagan Babylonian empire or proto-Babylonian empire. Abraham was drawn out. They settled in Haran. And in Haran, back in Genesis 12, God tells Abraham to leave all his family behind in Haran and to come down to the place he's going to tell them, which ends up being Bethel is where he lands, to come to the place he's going to tell them because he's going to give him that land with this inheritance as well as the rest of the Abrahamic covenant, the blessing. And so it's a bit of a trip to Haran across some pretty dangerous places. And all Jacob has is his staff and a little bit of oil, apparently, probably a little bit of food for provision. Bethel, just north of Beersheba, is only a couple of days travel. It depends on how scared Jacob is and how fast he got there. Uh, but it's, it's just a little short distance. One could possibly make it in a day, but that'd be a pretty long day to get to Bethel, probably two days to get there. Why Beersheba is mentioned here is that it's the southernmost, like largest settlement in the southernmost part of the Negev or the lower part that will be Israel in southern Israel. And so Beersheba is sort of the capital. The, they didn't have capital cities in these settlements like we would think of. It's the largest and most important and it's Isaac's hometown. It's where he grew up, and apparently where Jacob and Esau grew up as well. Now, let me just set something here. Now, this is hard for us to get in our mind as you're thinking through this story and how it happens. Jacob is probably around 77 years old when this all happens. So the only reason I think that's important is try to remove from your mind when you think of this story a scared little boy. Okay, that's, not, that's not the situation. We do know that individuals lived longer during, those t during that time than is usual. We also know that they don't seem to have lived longer in a necessarily delayed growth. They just live longer as adults. So, for example, Isaac and Esau both got married at 40. But Jacob's around 77 years old, and he's still unmarried. Um, so it's not like, well, that was like a kid in those days. That's not the way it works. He was an older man. He probably did not have the physical struggles of a modern 77 years old, but he's not a kid. It's just, as you're thinking through the story, I think that helps think through a little bit what happens there. So this man gets up, runs north, falls fast asleep, and God appears to him in a dream. A vision, he finds out. Now, the text says that he put a stone at his head. I don't know why this is in my mind, but when I was a kid, I mean, I think I've read songs and things. I always had the idea he, like, used a pillow, the stone for a pillow for his head. It's not actually what the Hebrew text says. It says he laid a stone, a large stone, at his head or at the top, at the front of his head. It actually makes a lot more sense that he's gathering large stones around him and around his head to keep out the slithering critters at night that happen to be in this part of the world. Makes a lot more sense than him thinking, you know what, I'll find a stone and make that a place for a pillow at night. Um, this actually is only important in the story because of what happens at the end with an anointing of this same stone. It doesn't really matter where he put his head. And that's why it's mentioned is so that we will have that detail for when it says that there's a stone that's set up, a stone of remembrance at the end. 
Um, so he gathers in, he's basically hunkering down, like someone might find a cliff outcropping and put their back up against that, you know, like to try to shield themselves so things can only come at this way, they could see it coming, so he's protecting himself. So he goes to sleep, he must have traveled a long ways, it must have been, because he's, he's out. And then God has this vision for him, a very interesting one, one that has captured the imagination and the minds of commentators for thousands of years. The older they go, the weirder the interpretations get. Um, reading some of the ancient people and talking about, well, maybe there's 15 rungs on this ladder, and the two sides represent this, and the 15 rungs are, and they just go all out. And I think it's because whenever there's a dream or a vision from God or something that, and it's very brief, people just suddenly let their imagination go. Um, and there is some interpretive things we need to think about here, but let's just think about it just as a dream for now. Okay. So in this dream, what does he see? What happens? Well, there's a ladder, or quite literally in the Hebrew, steps. So probably not like you think of like a ladder, aluminum ladder sort of thing, but think like steps up somewhere. And there's these steps going up, and above it, it said above these steps, there is uh, Yahweh standing above the steps. It's very clear in the text that Yahweh is over it. He's over the ladder. He's above the ladder. Or he's at the entrance. He's at the top. And he's watching and he's overseeing what's going on in these steps. And what's going on is the angels or the spirits of, that God has created, they are going up and down. Once again, fanciful interpretations. I read one guy who was like, yeah, those going down, those are like, the bad people going to hell, and those going up are like the good people going to heaven, and I'm just thinking, man, where, where, do you, where do you come up with this stuff? This is just angels, okay? They're going up and down the steps, and the Lord is watching it. Now, here's what's remarkable about the dream. That's it. Like, that's the dream he has. God says something, the Lord says something now, which I think wakes Jacob up, and I don't believe he dreams this. I believe he then wakes up and he hears this, and that basically this is the, the oracle that he receives. Now it's not, may the God of Abraham bless you, or may you receive the Abraham blessing. It's the actual blessing that God gave to Abraham. Let me read it for you. The Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the east, to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the Abrahamic blessing. That's nearly identical to chapter 12. In chapter 12, God tells Abraham, all the land which you see, I give to you and your seed forever. He even says north, south, east, west, says the same thing. To um, Jacob, he says, I will give you this land to you and your seed. Also, your seed shall be the dust of the earth. He says to Abraham, your seed will be as the dust of the earth. And then this most important part is the heartbeat of the covenant. He says, and in you, to Abraham, in Genesis 12, all families of the earth shall be blessed. To Jacob, he says, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so we've known, we've gone through our study. That's a reference to Christ, the Messiah, the seed. So it's the same blessing. But he adds something that he doesn't say to Abraham, that he adds to Jacob personally in verse 15. And he arrests his attention with the word behold. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So he adds this amazing word of assurance to Jacob. One author said, it's the first time in Scripture someone hears from God, I am with you. I'm with you. I'll guard you or keep you wherever you go. And we'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. It's very strong very powerful words of assurance to Jacob. So Jacob awakes from his sleep or comes up from the dream and he knows it's not a dream. And he says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. 
He says, did not know it like when he laid down to sleep there. It's like, I wasn't planning to come to the house of God, but evidently I came to the house of God. Because God is here. Elohim is here. Jacob's response is very interesting. He responds with first acknowledging that this is real. That this wasn't just, uh, you know, bad food from the night before. Like, the God, is it, this is, God is in this place. This is real. So he responds with an acknowledgement it's real. But he also responds with an acknowledgement that it's really frightening. Because then he says, and he was, the, Moses wants us to see it, and then it says what Moses says, and then the author, and then it gives Jacob's words. He says, and, and, uh, he was afraid, Yura, and said, how awesome. Now, that translation, and most translations translate this way, and I'm not sure why, because that's the same word as afraid. How fearful or terrifying is this place? Now, that could be, and we don't have time for this, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that the concept of fearing God has both a negative and a positive connotation to it, right? And so we have to differentiate whether it's talking about something in a positive way or a negative way. That's a, that's a whole large study for another time. You can work this out on your own, but I think that Jacob is not referring to this in a holy sense of amazement at God, but rather the terrifying nature. A couple of reasons why I think that. First of all, his immediate reaction is not worship. His immediate reaction is one, bargaining. And secondly, he leaves. If this is the place, the house of God, where God, he will be safe in God, and he believes this, and he has a righteous fear of God, then why doesn't he stay here? <laughs> why does he get up and leave the next day? That's all the evidence is of somebody who's terrified rather than somebody who's worshiping, worshiping in awe. You can disagree with me, that's fine, you can work it out. But I think the context reveals, as we'll see as we keep going through this, he's afraid. Now that in and of itself is not a bad response that's the first response the sinners ought to have, especially one who just jilted his brother, deceived his father, and is on the run, and God shows up. Probably ought to have a little bit of uh, terror at that. But it's not enough of a response. That's the problem. It's maybe how we begin, but it's not how we should conclude a situation. What a strange vision He adds that this is so strange, he's going to name the place Beth, or Beit Elohim, house of God. Bethel is where this name comes from. Now, Bethel in the Bible is significant in Jewish history. In the past, it was, in Genesis chapter 12, it was the first place where Abraham encountered God after he had come into the promised land. So God, he received the blessing before he was here. He received the blessing in Haran. And he came down and he stopped at Bethel or Luz. And there he received another word from God, the reaffirmation of the covenant. And there Abraham built an altar and worshipped. You see the difference? Interestingly, Bethel is also mentioned because in Genesis 12, immediately, Abraham loses faith and he runs down to Egypt. And the text tells us in Genesis um, chapter 12, verse 8, that Abraham came back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, where the altar was built in Bethel. So he even recognized, Abraham recognized when I strayed, I come back to the house of God. It wasn't named Bethel at the time, though you'll find that in Genesis 12. It's just because the importance of it. It was named by Jacob. Presently, this is important because not only this vision, but this is going to be really important. And this is where I was debating how to go about this in the sermon today. Um, there's a little bit of spoilers here. And I, and I think, though we know the stories, many, most of us, uh, I think Moses wants us to kind of get them gradually because it helps with sort of realizing it. Bethel is going to be super important in Jacob's life. 
because Jacob will come back to Bethel. 20 years later, in Genesis chapter 31, God will tell him, isn't it about time you go back to Bethel? And Jacob's like, yeah, it's time I go back to Bethel. And he, in Genesis 35, he goes back to Bethel. And guess what? Um, he has another experience with God. It's a little different. If you want to look ahead, you can. But I think what happens in Bethel the second time is very different than this first time. Because I think what we see is Jacob becomes a new creation. He is born again in Bethel. Not here, but 20 years from now, which would put him almost 100 years old. But in the future, Bethel will have an important part of Jewish history. It's most likely that Elijah's, um, Elijah's ba- the most famous prophet in Israel, his base of operation is Bethel, and even builds a prophet school in, near Bethel. Um, king Jeroboam, an evil king, he sets up false worship with golden calves in Bethel, the house of God. Uh, Amos and Hosea, minor prophets, write about Bethel as a place where God's people are meant for true worship, but they'd have become false worshipers. Bethel's an important place. Why? First and foremost, Bethel, and this is a simple answer, it's the geographical center of Israel. God intends to give his covenant and says, look north, south, east, west. This is all your land. It's the geographical center of Israel. Secondly, I think the most important part of Bethel is that Jacob's encounter with God, is the, this encounter is a preview for the most important encounter that Jacob has with God as a um, illustration of every one of us in our most important encounter with God when he turns us from dead to alive. I think that's why Bethel is so important. Let's jump now, before we finish the story, to talk about the dream. Is there any significance to this dream? What does it mean? Well, we know that it's where God gives the covenant, but what does it mean with the ladder and Yahweh and all of that and the angels going up and down? Jacob not only calls this the house of God, but he also says this is the gate of heaven. So what Jacob is recognizing is that here what he is seeing is the opening to the spiritual realm, the gate of heaven where angels are coming up and down. He's describing something I think similar to what Isaiah the prophet experiences when he gets taken up and he sees the throne room. Jacob doesn't get taken to the throne room of heaven, but the door to the throne room of heaven he sees. It's descriptive of Ezekiel, and he sees the throne, and and then Paul, the apostle, has said he's taken up to the third heaven. All the similar sort of thing. This is a vision of God's uh, resting place, or God's sovereign, authoritative place of rule, heaven. And so he's seeing sort of like the entrance to heaven. Makes sense, right? Why angels are coming and going, doing the bidding of God. So this is the idea of it. It's a very simple interpretation. Yahweh, the Lord God, is standing at the entrance to his heaven, to his kingdom. And he is sending out his ministers, his flaming fire, his angels, to do his bidding on heaven and in earth. And they are actively doing the work of God. And God is standing, the Lord is standing there as if he is this sovereign authority over heaven and earth. And everything that happens, even the deception by a well-meaning mother and greedy son, is under the auspices of God's sovereign authority. Even the fact that he's on the run, going to Padan Aram, is under the authority and the auspices of a sovereign God who is overseeing heaven and earth. And that's the expression here. God is expressing to Jacob, I am God. That's why he's afraid. Because he sees the gate of heaven and who's standing at the top. Yahweh, I am. The Holy One is standing there in authority. You could almost imagine him standing there as a director would, con- would conduct an orchestra, the angels going up and down, or as an owner of a company would oversee his employees, or as a king would watch over from the highest tower his kingdom and see all that lays before him. That's the idea here. That's the main interpretation, and that would be all that we would understand from it. If 
Jesus hadn't said something about this. And he does. It's very interesting. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. I believe this is a reference. Every other commentary I read believes this is a reference to Jacob's ladder. John chapter 1. Jesus is revealing himself. He's been revealed by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's revealing himself and calling his disciples. There's a disciple to be named Nathaniel, a very Jewish man, very devout follower of Yahweh. Philip, his friend, comes to Nathaniel and says, We found the Messiah, we found the seed. We found, we found the, 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 the result, the fullness of Abrahamic blessing. And saying this to a very devout follower of, of, of Yahweh is a big deal. But he's, and then he says this, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, oh, wait, 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 wait. Not from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It can't be the Messiah. So Philip says, come and see. So Nathanael says, all right, I'll come and see. And so verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, as a sovereign God would, right? Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, he's the all-knowing, all-seeing God, right? That's what Jesus is saying. I saw you as one would stand over his kingdom, as one who would stand over the gate of heaven, watching out, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip even talked to you. Nathaniel's response is the right response. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He got it. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Is he talking about miracles, walking on water? Is he talking about greater things, demons cast out? What does he mean by greater things? Look at what he says. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Son of Man is a reference to Christ, Messiah. It's a reference from Daniel. Angels ascending, descending. The only other place we see this in the Scripture is Jacob's ladder. Jesus is making an allusion to Jacob's ladder, or he's using Jacob's ladder as an illustration. But did you notice the big change where is the Son of Man in Jacob's vision? Where is the Messiah, the Yahweh? He's above overseeing, sovereignly ordering it, sending the angels up and down. What does Jesus say? Where is the Son of Man, the Messiah? Where is he going to be that's far more amazing than simply standing over the gate of heaven? He, will says, he says, you will see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Epi, that, that's not, it's very clear. Jacob sees the Messiah, Christ, standing over, above. Jesus says, I am Jacob's ladder. I am the steps. The angels of heaven, when they go up and down, they're going up and down on me. He'll say it a little bit clearer without parable in John 14, 6. He'll say this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through, upon me. Jesus applies Jacob's ladder to himself and says, I am the ladder. I am the steps to heaven. What's more marvelous about the Son of Man standing over is the Son of Man condescending and coming down 
and becoming the way to God. Jesus as God doesn't just tell us, come to me, come to the Father, come up, come to the gate of heaven. He comes down and becomes the way to heaven. That's what Jesus is saying here. So the dream is pretty significant. It has some pretty significant meaning not only to Jacob, but it has some pretty significant meaning to us too. The way to God is Christ alone. That's the meaning of the dream. That's great. That's amazing. I don't think Jacob got all that. For good reason. He doesn't see the picture. He doesn't have Jesus saying this, right? He doesn't, he doesn't have the whole story like we do. Let's move to Jacob's response to this whole thing. So we know he got afraid. So when he finally works up the courage to do something, what does he do? Well, he decides perhaps this would be a good time to make a vow, to promise God some things. In fear, he decides to make a deal. Verse 15, that is, went back to Genesis, sorry. Genesis uh, 28, verse 15, that's what God says. Behold, I am with you, I will keep you. Wherever you go, I'll bring you. I'll keep you wherever you go. Where, we bring you to back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Jacob responds to this with his own promises that actually correspond, understandably, in verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. That's his promise. Did you notice how it's similar? God says, I will keep you. I, I am really with you. I'm with you. It's emphatic in the Hebrew. I, I added the word really there. I am really with you. Jacob's vow, if God is with me, if God will be with me. I will keep you or guard you wherever you go. If God will keep me in this way that I'm going, I will bring you back to this land so that I come back to my father's house in peace. I will not leave you. Then the Lord will be my God. I won't leave him. So he's responding to the covenant with his own covenant, with his own vow to God. Okay, seems reasonable, seems rational, seems like what a, what a person might do, a person who really believes they've encountered God might do. And a lot of people um, that I read look upon this story and, and come away praising Jacob for this. Promising to give him a tithe at the very end, he says in 2022, and this stone which I have set as a pillar, he puts a little oil on a stone and sets it up, the one by his head, shall be God's house, and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you, a tithe. Seems to be, that they say that he even gives a tithe. That's similar to Abraham giving Melchizedek a tithe. That's a, something commanded in the law for God's people to give a tithe to, to Yahweh. And they, one, one said, this is a deceiver turned worshiper. And I don't want to pick on Jacob because I feel like I am Jacob most of the time. But frankly, I just don't get it. I don't see Jacob's vow and his tithe and all that stuff as anything to imitate here. To put it in maybe harsher words, I don't see Jacob as the good guy here. I don't see him as a worshiper. Let me explain why in a minute. But that's what I, I, I so I acknowledge that I am going against the grain of what most commentators and scholars have come up with when they read this. I recognize that. Now, I'm not alone. There are some who agree with me. But it's, it's, it's the minority position interpretation of the text. But why? Well, there's three things in comparison I think could be helpful here. We'll get to those. Jacob is also the first person. I said he's the first person to hear I am really with you. He's also the first person in the scripture to say that it says made a vow with God which is interesting to me, historically, Abraham and Sarah received the covenant, same covenant promise from God and they didn't respond by making a vow with God. Isaac and Rebekah, they received the covenant promise and they didn't respond with making a vow to God. Jacob does though. Spoiler alert. Promises are meant to be received with faith-filled gratitude. 
I think Jacob believes the divine promise is to be earned through his faithful activity. And that only after God proves himself, then we will see about this. And here's the three notes of comparison. There may be more, but here's the three I noted. First, notice how God's covenant is generous and Jacob's vow is minimal. Notice how God's promises are generous. I am completely with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not ever leave you. How many times does God say you to Jacob? You, 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 you. How many times does Jacob use the pronoun I or me? Work that one out on your own. But even though Jacob's vow, though perhaps good and admirable offer, I will surely give a tenth to you. Even after all that, I will completely be with. Doesn't that seem a little bit even minimal? And after you've given me all this stuff you've promised, I'll give you a tenth of it. Now, I'm not saying that that's not commanded in the word of God for the old covenant people. I'm just saying it just, the whole thing together, it seems rather minimal. But all that God has promised in comparison. Second note of com- comparison God's covenant is spiritual. Jacob's vow is material. God's covenant does include temporal blessings, material blessings, the land, for example. But the gist of the covenant is clearly the blessing of God's own spiritual presence. I'm with you. I will not leave you. I will guard you. I'm here, Jacob. Jacob's vow, on the other hand, acknowledges God's presence as a good thing. Good, I hope you're with me, and I hope you keep me going this way so that you can give me food and clothes. Because he adds that little bit in there in his vow that's not present in any of the vow that God gave. You provide for me the physical material things that I need and we got a deal. It seems different to me. Now, it's not to say that material things are not important or God's provision, material provision is not it's a blessing from God, but it's, it's secondary. But to Jacob, it seems primary. Thirdly, God's covenant is unconditional. Jacob's vow is conditional. Did you notice in the Lord's covenant, he never once asks for a response or uses the word if? I will, I will, I will, I will. And Jacob says, if, 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 then I will. It's conditional versus unconditional versus conditional. No conditions placed upon Jacob. Just as no conditions are placed upon Abraham or Isaac when God brought the covenant to them because God's covenant is wholly based on grace alone. But Jacob's vow is conditional. Okay, Jacob, when he says, then the Lord shall be my God. That, you speak truth there, sort of. Though the Lord is your God in the authoritative sense, and he is everyone's God in the authoritative sense, he clearly is not yet his God in the relational sense. And this is significant here because what you see in the Lord's covenant is this idea of a father who's opening his arms up and saying, I'm with you, I'm with you. And Jacob meeting that covenant with his hand outstretched. All right, let's strike a deal. And there are two very different ways to stretch out your hands. And God's promises are meant to simply be received rather than to be met with the cold hand of let's shake on it. And that's exactly that's the, the, the tone that is coming through here. The postures are quite distinct between God's unconditional covenant and Jacob's conditional vow. But then what should be our takeaway? What should be the response? So, so we look at this, we go, okay, so maybe Jacob should have been generous in his vow. So instead of saying, I'll give you a tenth, he should have said, I'll give you everything. Is that the solution? Or perhaps his should have been, okay, forget about the material stuff. I'll just focus on the spiritual side of it. Okay, your spiritual blessing, I'll make a vow and a spiritual blessing as well. Or perhaps he should have made an unconditional covenant back. God gave him an unconditional covenant, and Jacob should respond with, okay, then I'll serve you no matter what happens. Is that the takeaway? Is it when we compare the covenants, is it that, that, well, Jacob's covenant was just not good enough? He should have done better. 
This answer might surprise you, not if you've been around grace for very long. But the problem wasn't ultimately that Jacob's vow was minimal, materially motivated, or conditional. The problem was that Jacob completely misses the intention of divine promise and a divine covenant. God's promises to sinners are not meant to be met with equal displays of human promises of effort and obedience. Rather, a divine promise is meant to be received with joy. God's open arms of generous grace are not meant to be responded to with our hands outstretched ready to make a deal with Him. Worship and obedience are, are the consequences of God's grace, not the cause of it. The same grace of God who promises that in Christ He is really with us. He will guard us and our soul wherever we go. He will bring us into the eternal land and He will never leave us or forsake us. That promise in Christ, my friends, is meant to be met with reception, with faith, to believe on Him. It's not meant to be meant with vows of obedience, promises of greater religious activity, assurances of I'll do my best and be righteous. But the promise of the grace of God in the gospel is meant to be met with the simple and sincere gratefulness of faith alone in Christ alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be.